Hi, Catherine, can you see me? Good. Stuff. I can see you, Gemma. Can you Great. hear me, Gemma? I can indeed, yeah. Is that you, Brian? Cool, good. Yeah, good, good, good. And Colin, Mark, yeah. hello. Good morning. Good morning. Hello, Mark. I'm actually on a ship. Uh, I'm on a ship halfway across the English Channel at the moment, so uh, I hope my connectivity uh, stays. But it uh, wasn't part of the original plan, but here we go. Morning, Colin. Morning. Morning. So while we're waiting, folks, I just thought I'd uh, just run through the questions very quickly with you all, if that's okay. Yep. So the first question is, uh, what are the current new skills we need to develop uh, in order to equip our industry for tomorrow? I'm going to ask Colin to lead off on that one, and then I'll go through Philip, uh, Brian, uh, and Gemma. Uh, then the, the second question is, what does the industry need to do to continue broadening diversity in people and skills? I'll ask Gemma to lead off on that one and then come to Philip, uh, Brian and Colin. Then the third question, what challenges do we face when considering STCW revision before 2030? Brian, I'd ask you to, to lead off on that one and then I'll come to Gemma, Colin and Philip. And the fourth question, what is the potential for digitalization to transform industry workforce management and their development over the next five years? I've brought that back from 2030 because pace of that, if I was asking what we're going to be doing by 2030. I'd give you a medal and a big prize if you could tell me in terms of digitalization. But Philip will lead on that, followed by Colin, Brian and Gemma. Uh, and what others, the, the, the opening person, I'll, I'll keep you to about four or five minutes and then allow follow-ups and that should get us through all of the questions in about three quarters of an hour which gives us 15 minutes at the end to be fielding questions that will have come in through from from the conference and from attendees at the panel everybody comfortable with that yep yep phew <laughs>
Mark, you're on mute if you can hear us, I think. Good morning. I, That's I, better. Good morning, everybody. Welcome now. to the People panel. I, I suspect that you're on mute will be one of the most used phrases of the, <laughs> the last two years. Um, good morning, everybody. My name is Mark Stagg. I'm Dean of the Faculty of Nautical and STEM at City of Glasgow College. Um, and I'm very pleased to be moderating the People panel today. It's often said that... Uh, People are the most important assets, and indeed, I think if you take the people out of any industry or organisation, all you've got left is is stuff. Um, I'd like to start by thanking Northern Marine Group for for sponsoring this people panel. Um, and if I can just introduce the panelists, we have Gemma Griffin, uh, director from DFDS, uh, Brian Johnson, who's chief executive officer of the Maritime and Coast Guard Agency, uh, Philip Fullerton, managing director of Northern Marine Group and Colin McMurray, Managing Director of Stream Marine. So good morning to you all. Okay. So we've got, uh, we've got a number of questions that I'm going to be posing to the panel. And uh, if you want to ask questions as we go along, we'll, we'll field those at the end. But what I'd like to do is we'll go through the four topic areas and then we'll take questions from everybody uh, at the end to ensure that we cover all the areas we'd like to get done in the next hour. So the first question uh, is, uh, what are the current and new skills that we're going to need to develop and equip our industry for tomorrow? Um, and I'd like to start, first of all, with Colin. Good morning, everyone. Um, it's a good question and, and probably one that's too easy to categorise or focus in, in one particular area. It's probably a blend of skills and, and technology. Um, maritime industry is a broad church. It's important to frame probably all the skill requirements in the wider industry. So, I mean, the industry's changed hugely in the last 12 months. So you look at the effects of COVID and Brexit, it's had to adapt. Uh, some of those changes have been welcome, some of them not so much. Um, but technology is the obvious one and probably covers everything from basic to advanced IT skills, data analytics, engineering, research. Um, Probably, you know, if you see some of the, the recent work on autonomous ships, gives us a, an indication of where potentially the future's, future lies. So if you break that down into sort of probably three areas, you're, you know, from a skills perspective, you're looking at sort of higher cognitive skills. So things like uh, advanced literacy, writing, critical thinking, uh, complex information processing. Uh, you'll also need social and emotional skills. So soft skills, if you like, um, advanced communication, negotiation, empathy, adaptability, and leadership. And probably leadership is, is, a, is a key one there. And, and all of these have been identified, you know, if you look through things like the McKinsey Global Report or, you know, even through the Nautilus survey, you, you know, you, you'll see those sort of three areas being echoed right the way through. So if we look at leadership, you know, we probably need to ensure that we're equipping those coming into the industry in whatever capacity have leadership skills required. You know, we make the assumptions the captain's automatically a good leader because of their position, but that, that's more, you know, that sort of leadership's more geared towards compliance and emergency leadership. 
Um, you know, it's not really having to steer employees towards targets or business goals, driving change, inspiring, delivering results. So it's important that, you know, it's a broad, broad base that we give everybody in the industry. And I think that's probably probably the, the three big key areas that we're going to have to develop both for today and for tomorrow. Thank you, Colin. Um, Philip, is there anything you'd like to, to bring forward on that as well? From a Northern yeah. Yeah. Yeah, sure. Thanks, Mark. Um, thanks, Colin. Uh, good introduction to, to to some of the areas when we're looking at the skill changes for for tomorrow uh, and indeed into the future. I, I suppose from a, a shipping company perspective, uh, we, we look ahead and what we see challenges that are are coming along our way. Um, autonomous ships, semi-autonomous ships. Uh, we're getting towards uh, even from a ferry point of view, where you know. Uh, driverless vehicles, concepts, all of these areas that we start to have to consider what sort of uh, human talent do we need for the future. Um, from a skills point of view, traditional training um, has really followed STCW uh, requirements that, that look more about uh, competency uh, assumptions whereby we, we train people on the basis that they are competent as opposed to maybe doing some sort of competency evaluations. Um, looking ahead to the future definitely uh, with more connectivity with uh, the ships even during the dis dis discussions this morning from the panelists uh, there's quite a lot of focus on uh, how we interact with the people on board today how we do virtual ship visits virtual audits uh, virtual uh, classification remote surveys so there's, there's going to be a higher competence required in the it and the automation side of things and i think to try and bring uh, the, the, the competencies that are required for the future uh, and start working on that because as well as we know uh, we're looking at a longer term plan but for, for a conference being focused around 2030 as an immediate target it's not long at all and if new training takes three four years for many people I mean we really have to make these changes now uh, to be ready for what's uh, ahead of us in the future. Sustainable shipping, of course, was another topic um, that was mentioned this morning, and it's becoming a, a greater focus because it's without doubt the biggest challenge the industry has uh, moving ahead, both 2030, 2050 uh, requirements that are specified by IMO. And, um, you know, new fuels, what fuels we'll be using in the future, what skills do we need on board to, to manage the vessels with uh, this technology. Um, we're, we're looking at uh, probably a change from the traditional deck engine nearing, uh, segregation, uh, more crossovers, um, a heavy reliance um, on simulator training, simulator competency, uh, assessing this competency from a, a, on a periodic basis, um, still uh, from a, a skill set point of view and a, a company point of view, most of the training that we do is training outside of mandatory training because there's a huge gap in the mandatory training. Uh, that means that we have to spend a lot more time doing um, uh, preferred training to, to increase the skill sets of those on board. And I, I think that the, the mandatory training should be covering much more uh, and not from the traditional courses or safety courses that we've seen the STCW focuses on over the years. It should be more on a, a definitely a competency based um, criteria and indeed uh, a, a competency review uh, that maybe takes place at five year intervals that other industries uh, focus upon, whereby uh, when people pass certificates um, at the end of the day uh, in the maritime world, there's no further uh, confirmation of, of assessment uh, required in the future. So uh, people do lose touch with, with not only what we have today, but what we have for the future. Thanks, Philip. So I think uh, both uh, both yourself and Colin were touching on this, um, this theme of continuous professional development. So how do we maintain that as a lifelong theme rather than uh, maybe you cross the, the Rubicon when you get your certificate of competency and, and then that's it. Uh, Brian, can I come to you? Yeah, thank you, Mark, um, and good morning. So uh, a very pertinent panel to be uh, involved in, thank you. I'm uh, chairing a subgroup on the Maritime Skills Commission at the moment, uh, looking at uh, seafarer training. And uh, uh, what I'm going to talk about this morning is, is some of the forming views of that subgroup. I guess we're about two thirds of the way through our work and have had a lot of input from uh, colleges, classification societies and uh, shipping operators. And in the next month, we'll be doing a focus group with uh, past and present cadets. And the messages have been uh, very, very consistent. Uh, 
and you'll recognize them uh, from some of the previous speakers. So there are some big trends at the moment. Uh, uh, new fuels, uh, whichever options, and we heard Graham's perspective on it earlier, whichever options are far harder, orders of magnitude harder to handle than heavy fuel oil. Um, that will bring about a step change in operating culture and safety culture requirements on board ships. And that brings a huge emphasis on leadership skills. And universally, the input we've had is that uh, the current seafarer education sim system simply does not uh, produce people uh, who are uh, who have the confidence in their leadership and interpersonal skills uh, to do some of the things that are going to be required in the future. So I'd echo the uh, uh, the point made about leadership skills. I think the second, uh, uh, another of the trends is uh, increasing automation and um, higher and higher levels of technological uh, agility. Uh, uh, the shipping operators were saying uh, we're going to be required of uh, officers joining them. So something huge about technological agility. Um, the third very consistent theme is bound up in one of the other changes going on, which is a sociological one. And that um, uh, uh, people going to see uh, what our shipping operators are seeing is they're spending less time during the seafaring part of their career. And uh, shipping operators are very, very keen that we turn cadets out from the education system who are prepared not just for a life at sea, but for a career in the maritime sector. And that came across very, very strongly. And I guess just before I wrap up, I think there was a, a very consistent message uh, from all of the inputs that uh, seafarer education and the way that we deliver it is a huge opportunity for the UK. But we're going to have to get used to changing at a pace that we've not seen before in that particular sector. Thank you. Thanks so much, Brian. Some some interesting points there. I think I think the point on uh, uh, agility and movement uh, at pace is is well made. Uh, I was at a conference not so long ago at the college actually where the the point was made by both the UK and US representatives that the the flash to bang when it comes to SDCW was about 10 years which is which is incredible when you think how fast we're developing but we'll be picking up SDCW a little bit later Gemma can I can I come to you yeah certainly thanks Mark and good morning everybody from a very sunny but very cold mid uh, point in the channel somewhere between France and UK on a vessel right now but uh, so I hope you can hear me okay. I don't want to reiterate all the points that the guys have made very valid indeed. And for me, it's absolutely down to technology and leadership. But for me, focusing in on leadership and specifically in terms of looking at a future there are opportunities for seafarers who want to come ashore and indeed who we want to come ashore to be the future leaders in our organization, whether that's in technical organizations or, or CEO ranks, whatever the case may be. And I think uh, Colin made a very good point earlier on about uh, automatically assuming that a captain makes a fantastic leader. And I think uh, what we have to do a small body of work on is uh, this concept of bringing somebody from the, the, the ship-based background into a shore-based wider organization, whereby they're excellent in their field of competency but often a four stripe type of leadership model doesn't necessarily uh, transfer to a suit and tie environment shall we say and all the different things uh, that uh, you need to uh, embrace in that respect so I do strongly believe that we need to ensure that all these fantastically competent uh, colleagues that we have on board vessels are trained and, and maybe even comes more down to coaching and ensuring that they are fully fully immersed in a commercial world and uh, and identify quite early on um, in their in succession planning, you know, rather than just, you know, interview somebody, take them ashore, put them in a leadership role and expect them to automatically be able to make that transfer. So for me, that's something that we really ought to think about uh, formalizing a little bit more and ensuring that we do everything that we can to make these fantastic people successful in the next uh, life cycle of their career, shall we say. Thank you, Gemma. Um, before we move on from this question, I just wanted to pose a question to all of you, which is, um, we have uh, ships officers um, who are purposely trained and, and developed to be competent in that role. Uh, is there some work we should do potentially to have some form of rotational opportunities so that they're 
having some boots on the ground experience uh, before this kind of leap because I think it's difficult to, or it's challenging to lay the accusation at the door of of, of, um, of ships officers that they don't transition early into the wider sector if that opportunity isn't provided to them for 5, 10, 15, 20 years and then suddenly they're supposed to do that. What, what's the thought of the panel? If, if I can maybe come in, Mark. Um, right, yeah. uh, really uh, very, very interesting question. It actually came up in one of the... Uh, discussions we had we had the other week um, and I think it was very interesting to reflect for example in in the Royal Navy that you get you you go to sea you come ashore you go to sea you come ashore and there is a there's a cyclical uh, uh, nature um, now you know recognizing there are differences between merchant Navy and Royal Navy big differences but I think it did strike us that in the merchant Navy you have a tag attached to you you're either at sea or your at sea career is, is is finished and there isn't the sort of rotation that you're talking about mark and I, I i think from the input of the shipping operators that we've seen couldn't agree more that actually uh giving people a uh a more rounded a wider early career uh, adds real real value to this and probably would improve retention within the sector as well thanks brian um, hopefully we will We'll come back to that a bit later on when we hear from, from the wider conference. I'd like to move on to the, the, the next question, really. And, Jeremy, if I could come to you and ask you, what do you feel that the industry needs to do to continue broadening diversity in terms of both people and skills? Yeah, thanks, Mark. That's a really interesting question. And I, I realise that this is in the context of, uh, you know, what, what shape we're in and what we look like in 2030. But I'd like to flip that around, actually, and say it's about today for me. If we look at the state that the industry is in today, simply as a result of this uh, ongoing pandemic that we find ourselves in, certainly in the uh, in the, the cruise and ferry industry, we have seen significant amounts of downsizing, restructuring, redundancy, reorganisation, whatever terminology we want to use. Use. And certainly from uh, our own perspective, even within DFDS, we've had a significant amount of redundancies across the board and, and hugely on the onboard side, uh, on all departments. And uh, we found ourselves in a, in a bit of a conundrum this year in many respects, because whilst we're working really hard on diversity topics, um, when we looked at the path of our reshaping uh, projects this year, we not through design but simply through default we are now seven percent um below what we were in terms of male female gender split so we've lost seven percent more of women than we had in 2019 uh, female seafarers across all uh, uh, departments and a um, couple of different reasons for that is because as anybody that works and when you're doing pro, uh, programs such as this, you all you always want it to be a, as as a painless as possible and without any industrial issues. So often you uh, you take voluntary programs rather than compulsory redundancies, and it's very hard to uh, control, um, you know, who goes out unless you put some very strong principles around that. So we had a combination of factors impacting not least on women but also on uh, other nationalities, whereby people were having difficulty travelling to and from the UK just because of the pandemic, people making decisions that actually, you know what, I'm just going to come ashore now because it's it's too difficult and I might not get an opportunity for a lump sum again. And uh, so we've really had an impact on our workforce. Also from an age profile point of view, actually, which is really worrying too, because a lot of our older seafarers who are super important to us because they've got the knowledge, they've got the, the experience of the vessels. Some of our guys and girls came out of the yard with these vessels and, uh, you know, what, what they don't know is not worth writing down, you know. And uh, so we had this really, really odd situation of people with long, long service wanting to leave because it might be their last chance. And people quite early into their careers deciding, do you know what, it's not worth it in this kind of hassle travel type of environment we're working in. And also the risk to health and being key workers, frontline workers. So it's had a massive impact. And I'm sure that we're not unique in that respect. So I believe that if we don't take stock now, and I understand economically it's very difficult to put programs 
programs in place to recover because we're all waiting for passengers to come back. And until that trigger point happens, it's very difficult to invest. But I would suggest that we need to really start looking into future apprenticeship programs, cadet programs, and start making the investment now because in 10 years' time, the least of our concerns will be skills. It will be the availability of competent people. Thank you, Gemma. Uh, it's always the way, isn't it, that uh, you can spend uh, a lot of time uh, pursuing a strategy and then uh, a tipping point, a pivot point comes that, over which you have no control and uh, you then need to reconsider your strategy. Um, Philip, I was wondering if I could ask you to, to pick up on, on this point. Yes, uh, thanks. Uh, I think the comments that Gemma made are, are, are obviously very valid and uh, when we look across the the ferry and cruise industry um the ability to to be more diverse uh, with with the people and the skills indeed um allows greater opportunity uh, due to the nature of the, the business line they're in uh, I, th I think the difficulties become more obviously in deep sea fleet um where it's extremely difficult um from a diversity point of view um to work on and i think all steps to encourage this should be taken uh, Brian mentioned earlier on that uh, it's quite uh, s segregated, really, how people see the, the overall employment structure as well. You're either working at sea or you're working ashore. Um, there, there's nothing kind of in between. And I think maybe that's also one of the areas we must focus on is, is starting at the beginning, because uh, not only is it quite uh, um, siloed from uh, an organization point of view uh, those who work at sea and those who work at sh work on shore but i think those who even work at sea you're either a, you know an engineer or you're a, a navigating officer there's there's not a great scope creep outside of that so to make some of these roles more um open uh, to increasing diversity i think has to be uh, looked at even at the selection stage because um there's even a myth of at times of the, on the engineering side of things that it's all heavy lifting it's all more complicated this stuff but really what we're looking for for you know especially when we're looking towards our senior uh, officers on board is leadership and capability of course they have to understand the uh, the plant and the, and the maintenance requirements and various other things but it's it's not in the same how would you say uh thought process that many people have had over the years of, of, of a hard life at sea. So I think there, there has to be even more uh, targeting done at, at the entry level uh, to dispel some of the myths and, and encourage greater diversity uh, within the people and of course within the skills. And, and I think that the skill set again has been too regimented. Um, you're either you know, on a deck profile, you're on an engineering profile and there's nothing ever meets in between. And I, I think that definitely has to change, uh, especially when we look at uh, more complex at date with uh, uh, automation, various other things like that there. We have to get different skills and they're not traditionally polarised on one side of uh, the uh, the engineering st structure or one side of the navigation structure. And I think, again, b back to the selection recruitment side of things, we have to be looking at people who are going to join the industry and eventually come ashore and take positions. And it has to be more joined up. Thanks very much, Philip. It's, uh, it's an interesting point that both you and Gemma have made is about um, if we broaden the, the scope of the offering in terms of the pathways that you can follow, then it's more like to attract people rather than them feeling that potentially they're joining an industry that drives them down uh, a cul-de-sac. And even within that industry, that cul-de-sac can be deck or engine. Uh, Brian, can I come to you? Yeah, I'm, so I'm going to sort of talk, I suppose, about a diverse, diversity with a small d, so diversity of thinking, diversity of ideas, diversity of background and so on. Um, and I, th I think one of the interesting things, if we look on this sort of 2030 timescale, the sector is going to be in the middle of um, uh, a magnitude of change, which some of the people I've spoken to within shipping have said is as big as the transition from sail to steam 200 years ago. Um, it, it's absolutely enormous uh, and arguably there's uh, there's some incredibly exciting careers ahead for people uh, in the maritime sector and I, I think um, uh, again when we were talking in our subgroup one of our concerns is that um, I'm not sure a career in the merchant maritime sector even hits it to the long list of options for the vast majority of um, uh, youngsters uh, thinking about do, getting a qualification, a further education or higher edu quali education qualification. 
And one of the things uh, I think that characterizes maritime education is it's, it's quite unusual. It's, it's peculiar compared to other education options. And sometimes that peculiarity is a necessity, but often I don't think it is. I think it's just quirky. And uh, one of the very strong forming conclusions uh, of our panel is that um, uh, we think we think the whole way that uh, marita that seafarer education is is carried out uh, we need to think about how we normalize it how we take the peculiarities out so to give to give some examples we need to make absolutely sure that students coming into it have completely free choice about the academic institution that they go to and the type of qualification that they're going to receive at the end of it um, i don't think that is quite free choice at the moment um, pretty strongly steered to particular institutions. That's completely different to other areas of education. Um, I think one of the strengths that we've got at the moment is a broad range of qualifications earned, uh, uh, and we should make sure that that broad range of qualifications uh, continues. Uh, there are very few um, at the honours degree end of things, and that means we exclude a huge number of potential students uh, in terms of getting seafarer training on the uh, on their long list of options so i think you know keep the diversity of qualifications and introduce more options uh, for honors degrees uh, we talked about uh, we've talked a lot about broadening the education so that um, not only are students prepared for seafaring which is an absolute given an absolute must but they're better prepared for a broader career in the maritime sector and, um, and I put my hands up uh, from an MCA perspective because I don't think we've helped this in the past. But um, I do think we need to make sure that learning happens at a pace that suits the, the students. Those who are able to learn more quickly should be able to learn more quickly. Uh, and those who need to take it more steadily, um, absolutely the courses should be designed for them. And what I'm getting to here is we shouldn't judge the effectiveness of courses on the basis of the number of hours that people have spent in in the classroom they should be judged on the competency and capability that they've soaked up during that education and i think one of the huge surprises to me coming into the sector has been uh, how strongly weighted the judgment of the education system is on the basis of hours spent doing it and i think that's a fundamental change so i could go on and on about this and talk about postgraduate qualifications and so on but i think that the broader point is I think seafarer education needs to normalize itself much more with other educational options and through that uh, become attractive to a much broader church of students. Thanks so much Brian, some, some good points there and I, I think um, when we look at the recruits we're getting who are coming from school, one of the, the issues that uh, hampers diversity is that even within our core education system uh topics like physics uh the uptake by female students is far lower than by male students so immediately we've got an imbalance in our pull through and i think part of it is that uh we're not pushing into schools enough to say this is a fantastic opportunity fantastic industry to get into if you're interested these are the topics you might want to start thinking about studying now uh can I just ask uh, Colin if you'd like to, to close off on this? Question? Yeah, I think there, there's been some very valid points there. You know, Philip's talked about the, the diversity in, in, in terms of roots and potentially more crossover. Um, you know, the, the thinking that Brian has and some of the discussions that come on out of the MSC is it's quite topical because I think if you, but if we stretch that to the wider maritime industry, if we look at all, you know, it's it's probably, uh, as I was thinking, it's probably less tree and more forest. We've kind of had the trunk of the cadetship leading to the branches in the industry, whereas now with the apprenticeships and the various uh, entry points that we're having, it, it, it's a little bit more direct, shall we say. You know, if you want to go up that tree, you can you can start start seeding it very early on, as opposed to having to, to start the career at sea. So that's interesting, and I think that probably is attracting a different type of person that maybe didn't want to go to sea but wanted a career in the maritime industry. So it's important we keep that concept going. And then it's it's a standard things you expect in diversity. You know, it's it's the organisational culture, it's how we how we operate. You know, it's a flexibility in the work schedule. You're going to sea for four months sometimes doesn't 
doesn't tempt people working part time in a port or, or starting there may well do. So it's important we keep all of those topics open um, and, and keep trying to push it further down the path as well. Thanks, Brian. Yeah, a, a, a lot to be to talking about here, and I think there's some some good points coming in on, on the uh, chat line at the side as well. Uh, our next question is really about the challenges um, we face when considering STCW before, uh, and any changes we want to make before 2030. Um, in some ways, we've already touched on that in some in, in some areas. But Brian, can I ask you to start on that? Okay, yes, absolutely, Mark. I'm probably going to be slightly controversial about this, actually, because um, I don't think the barrier of change in our group doesn't think the barrier of ch to change at the moment is STCW at all. Um, uh, we, think we've, we think we're in an ecosystem which is finding it hard to change uh, and use the freedoms that exist currently within STCW. Uh, and, uh, you know, to be, to be you know, really frank, I would include... Uh, MCA within that. And we're doing a lot of work internally on how we how we promote change. So um, I think the challenge is more about how do we operate within within the current constraints of STCW and uh, make seafarer training really fit for the future. And uh, interesting, I saw a comment on the chat group uh, uh, from David Carter about uh, how do we sort out demand um, uh, for UK cadets in the maritime sector. I think there's a huge opportunity here. You know, shipping is going to go through these incredible changes over the next 20, 30 years. It's going to require some serious skills, both on shoreside and seaside, to make those changes happen. There is an opportunity for the UK to start turning out some absolutely differentiated young officers who can take those roles um, uh, and demonstrate those exceptional skills differentiated skills in helping the sex to make that change. But I think we've got a challenge, uh, and as I say, not SDCW. So one of the challenges, um, there are a, there's a huge uh, network of interest groups in the sector. I think all of them need to reflect on how they're going to support change and be forward thinking. We will not recreate Britain's historical maritime strength by looking backwards. We will only recreate it by looking forwards and i think that's a challenge to the whole of the the whole of the sector in its thinking i think secondly we need to think about how we fund and subsidize um, uh, seafarer training i'm not sure the way the current funding system is structured uh, encourages uh, or makes uh, change uh, straightforward so we're looking at that as a, a as a group within the skills commission I think we'd like to see a much more open market uh, environment for colleges and universities offering seafarer training, um, uh, giving students more freedom to, cho to choose where they go to, and with colleges competing for those precious uh, places at sea. And uh, organisations like my own, um, and we are doing this, as I said earlier, just need to reflect on how we encourage and don't prevent innovation. So that's a big focus for the MCA. And I suppose if I had to set just four priorities on the, how we might change the way that we train, and we can do all of these within current STCW constraints. One is base uh, judgment of, uh, of, of education on capability, not time. And there's something there, there about course pace, which I talked about already. Two, bring in uh, leadership and personal skills into the, into the training. That's absolutely within our gift to do uh, three let's get let's get our heads sorted on the use of simulation uh, there are some extraordinary discussions going on about use of stim simulators uh, in the sector and we've got to get over it and start, to start using them to the maximum extent and finally uh, let's sort out sea time consistency uh, dramatically improving it potentially through tighter application of our expectations and maybe thinking, thinking about some ongoing tutoring um, from the colleges whilst uh, the cadet are at sea. Thank you very much, Brian. A lot, a lot to be talking about there. Um, can I, can I um, move on and maybe ask Gemma your thoughts from, the, from an STCW perspective? Um, I won't take up too much time, but I'll just reiterate the point that Brian made there. I honestly think it's time now. And 
language and a future technological based shipping environment that we absolutely do need to look at competence over time spent. It's a very valid point and very, very important. And I, I see in the chat bar here, Steve Goslin has said, you know, that it's refreshing to hear you speaking about that, Brian, outcomes based education rather than input based. But of course, you know, we're in this model of SDCW and that can't be changed overnight. So I do believe that we need to harness our, our abilities to be able to influence that and to make some changes for the future. Thanks, Gemma. That's really helpful. Um, it, 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 is a, it is a complex period. I think the four, the four areas that Brian's uh, highlighted are, are, are critical. Um, Colin, could I ask you what your thoughts are? Yeah, it, it's, I suppose the question does come back to whether STCW is, is meeting the original objectives, you know, and then, you know, should we be reframing it, re, you know, reshaping it? Uh, pushing the boundaries. Uh, I think, you know, when we look at the skill set that is going to be required, you know, it, it does come out of how, how we're training and how, how maritime colleges are working. Um, you know, we do need to focus on the likes of the computing IT skills, the people skills, you know, there's going to be new fuel systems, you know, business skills to be able to, to move people. So that there's a, there's a whole there's a whole list of things that we probably need to try and fit in. And it's, you know, as Brian said, that the adjustment in how we're doing training, just, just rehashing what we've done or revisiting isn't going to change. It's a fundamental rewrite of the whole program. You know, we, we do need to use the technology. You know, we're, we're going to ask people possibly to be semi-autonomous driving ships in front of screens. You know, there's no better place to start learning that as a simulator. You know, we don't learn to drive a car by sitting in a classroom. You actually drive the car. You take lessons in the car. Why do we not do the same for shipping? So there's a lot to think about there, and, and again, you know, some some good points are made by both Jam and Brian. Thanks, Colin. And, and finally, Philip, your thoughts? Yes, um, my, my thoughts on STCW really go down two roads. Uh, one is what the UK can do from the STCW to improve our own training in the UK, and then, of course, what the UK can do to influence STCW for a global workforce. Uh, I think there's two separate uh, themes here and, and both are extremely important because at the end of the day, it's the catering for what the shipping companies require as opposed to what the, the, the training institutions um, look for uh, on a homegrown basis. So I, I think we'll have to look at it in two different distinct ways. Uh, for the, the ability not to uh, push the boundaries of STCW in the UK and make it as fit for purpose for us is, is actually a, a crying shame that we're not taking these opportunities. I think we're careering down the road at times, uh, driving along, looking through the rearview mirror. Uh, there's just no uh, perception of what's happening in the future and using the skills that the people who are influencing it and having opinions on it, I think really need to start thinking about what, what we need in the future and not, and not what's been needed in the past. Uh, and the second thing uh, is the international standing then is what the UK's position is to try and uh, look at the areas of STCW that can be uh, raised in the more global scheme to enhance global seafarers because uh, if we're not careful, STCW will just become a, the lowest common denominator across the, the global maritime side of things. And I think it's really important to us to take the opportunity to try and strengthen STCW, make it more fit for the, the future, but then have a, a separate uh, you know, capability to, to push the envelope for, for UK requirements. Thanks, Philip. It's an interesting, uh, I, th I find this, this discussion particularly interesting because in my mind, STCW is the minimum standard that the industry sets for competence as watchkeepers. It doesn't define the skill set of what we want from our people. And I think it's, it's that wraparound. Uh, so I think it, it's, not a, it's not a barrier. The challenge is if we consider it and allow it to become a limiter. That's right. You know, we cross that line and then we go, that's it, we've done it, we can stop now. Um, I'd like to move on to a, to a, a, a final question. Um, and this is, uh, it's, a, it's a lovely lead on actually, because it looks at uh, digitalization. Um, and the question is framed as, what does the panel see as the potential for digitalization to transform the industry workforce management and the industry workforce development uh, over the next five years. And if I could start with yourself, Philip. Yes, um, thanks, Mark. I suppose when we look at it in two areas again is the uh, the industry uh, workforce management and then the industry workforce development. I think in the industry workforce uh, management, digitalization has proved a big part already 
uh, for what's been done um, for the management and uh, monitoring of, of our seafarers. Uh, it wasn't so many years ago that many uh, green departments were full of filing cabinets stuffed full of paper copies of, of everybody's HR profiles, etc. Uh, Digitalisation, of course, has moved that forward into some very, very useful and uh, predictive systems that we're all using today. I think the most important area is, is the development side of things, because whilst the, the, the management of people um, it is good and I think some of the electronic certificates and electronic cards and all these things have been brought in now. It's much easier to help to uh, check if there's any uh, fraudulent issue, issuing of certificates, which we know has been a, an industry phenomenon uh, globally. And to stump these areas out, of course, the, the digital uh, footprint to assist with that, of course, is, is, is key. Um, but for the development of the people, um, really, uh, where do we start and where do we end in that one? I, I think what we have to start to do is, is, is tr use the data we have on people to, and what else happens in the maritime industry to trend. I mean, is it a case that we, you know, from, from our own systems, what we do is we look at the accidents, incidents, undesired events, uh, that happen within the fleet. We, we link it back to people. We look back at human behaviours. Is Are some people characteristically unsafe? Um, do we need them to, to, to regain focus to the specific training? Uh, what lead their development? Um, and how can we assist to uh, to match the needs of the people to the needs of the vessels? Because at the end of the day, it's, it's the needs of the vessels that take uh, the shape of what we need from the people. Um, and, and this is where I think it's important. Uh, if you look at the development side of things and by, by going through structured training and uh, competency assessment, because if we refer back to STCW again, there's no competency assessment requirements. It's assumed competency. Uh, I think there should be some sort of refresher uh, revalidation training. But with good um, transformation of, of systems, et cetera, that, that look after the, the monitoring and measurement of the crew, we should then start to look and see if there's trigger points where people may need more training, they may need specific training. They may have dem demonstrated uh, capabilities that would maybe take them down to uh, leading to a, a high potential for a shore career, a high potential for a senior officer role, uh, a high potential for some sort of uh, new uh, responsibility that's coming up with upcoming legislation. And uh, if it, nothing, nothing else, it might just give us good good uh, knowledge for specific type rating for different types of vessels. Is somebody more uh, tuned into being a, an officer on a LNG carrier or, or, or a, you know, a coastal, a coastal uh, uh, tanker? So uh, there's lots of different things can be used for this, but I think the the capabilities to, to know everybody and then know the people against the industry and, and indeed the individual operation of the company is critical. Thanks, Philip. Uh, uh, a number of really, really interesting points there, and I think uh, this idea of being able to to track and know what the what the skills of your people are and what the skills needs of your people are, so that you're you're ready for the next event rather than the event happening and then having to train to it. Um, can I ask uh, Colin your thoughts? Yeah, I, th I think some very good points are by Philip. So. You know, it, it's going to be the technology or technological developments that are going to probably define, you know, that, that the way that we employ people to do what task, what job. You know, we're going to, we're probably going to need to make sure we've got a, a pretty strong HR team in, in the business to do that. Um, you know, we've got to think about continuous and professional development. You know, that's going to be multi-dimensional training. Uh, that's, you know, to define the problem, the solutions. You know, we're going to have to adjust the workforce to match in with that. And if anything, COVID shown how suddenly home working, you know, possibly people didn't believe tasks. I've spoken to so many companies that would never believed they could work from home, but have, have found the solution. They've had to find the solution. So it shows when we're pushed into a corner, we're quite resourceful. And... You know, I think I think how we train people, you know, we'll come back to that old theme of, of the colleges, universities, how we're going to train people has to fundamentally change because we're going to need a different workforce. So we can't do the same thing as we're doing and expect a different output. So, yeah, there's 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 quite a bit to do. And, and just as Philip was saying, systems there, we brought eight new systems, software systems into the business in the last six months. And it's trying to keep people you know, the, 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 the systems coming in change things and change the process, but it's making sure people are trained to be able to use it and maximise is, is just as important. Thanks, Colin. Yeah, what's the, the old saying? Um, first, the definition of insanity is to carry on doing the same thing and expect a different result. Um, th thanks for those points. Uh, can I now go to, to Brian? Yeah, I, 
digitization, I, I guess, sort of really profound impact in um, three areas, uh, onboard automation, onboard access to the internet, and uh, uh, training aids. Uh, I'll just cover each of those sort of briefly. Uh, onboard automation already happening, pace of that's going to pick up. Uh, how big is full autonomy going to be? I guess that remains to be seen. I think what's certain though is we'll see more of more automation, uh, smaller crews over time. Uh, that'll require higher skill levels. Much more will be done remotely. I guess more and more engine monitoring, good example, uh, done remotely. And most crucially in this, uh, human interventions will be rarer, but much more critical. Um, uh, so, so there's a there's a really fundamental change uh, in the role and the way that humans uh, operate uh, on board coming. I think the second one, onboard Wi-Fi uh, access or, or or internet access. Uh, we worked with Iswan uh, just recently on a, uh, a a study on social interactions on board ships, and it's very clear they've changed fundamentally. Much less face-to-face -face socialising, uh, and you know there's a very wi-fi on board very mixed blessing uh very good plus points very very difficult minus points what's for sure is it makes the leadership position of the ship's officers even more crucial and even more subtle uh than maybe it was in the past so i think that that's part of where all of our discussion about leaderships come from i think the other piece is on board training and examination talked a lot about CPD amongst uh, panel members couldn't agree more. Uh, that's going to be very much a part of life. It's inevitable as technological change accelerates. And I also agree, I think um, uh, requalification uh, is also inevitable as technology changes. And um, being able to do that online is crucial. We, the MCA, had a situation a year ago where we had to check the competence of uh, several hundred officers on board because of a on board ships because of a problem with one of the courses and we found a way of doing that online with some quite sophisticated tools and that was very much uh, the shape of things to come and finally of course uh, simulators which uh, again we've talked about we see there's a lot of uh, chat on the uh, chat room about so i, I think yeah, digital changes the shape of uh, shape of the role quite dramatically but it's creating some tools that are going to be incredibly useful in the future Thanks, Brian. And uh, Gemma? Well, uh, observation for me, just coming back to, to Philip's original point about using data about our employees themselves. And uh, I think uh, one of the things I'd be really interested in is, you know, data-driven decisions. Are we really recording everything that we need to? For example, do we do exit interviews? Are we keeping digitalized records of why people leave our industry, why people stay in the industry? And is there anything that we can do with that knowledge that goes away when it puts it's a piece of paper is put into a fine a filing cabinet? But actually recording all of these things as an industry and understanding what it is that we need to do to develop the industry in terms of its attractiveness in the future and to be able to retain key employees. Thanks, Gemma. It's a it's a really fascinating topic, and the, the thing about data capture, I was I was just thinking as you were saying that was that uh, my experience has been that lots of organisations talk about lessons learned, but what they actually do is they acknowledge the lesson, the 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 information that comes out of it doesn't ever seem to transition its way through to uh, fundamental shifts in in understanding or culture otherwise we wouldn't see the 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 numbers of accidents that we have that look just like the ones before the one other area and i'd just like to ask the panel very briefly before we take uh start picking up some of the questions from the chat is with digitalization does a challenge also arrive in terms of managing cyber security because through these digitalization channels can come a threat and we've, we've seen it uh, in all sectors um, whether that's from universities being taken down to shipping companies having uh, uh, loss of data control uh, and the same in the oil and gas industry uh, what, what's the thoughts of the panel is that a skill that we need to develop in order to manage digitalization safety? yes I think it is um very much a skill mark and it's even one of the areas when we, we talk about uh, STCW revisions and various things like that I mean 
you know, we have to look to the future. We have to look and see what our challenges are, what the risks in our landscapes are, can continuously assess what risks we face um, in all areas. And of course, uh, cybersecurity is one of the big areas that can be a, a huge um, influencer and disruptor. Uh, to what we all do, and especially when it comes and uh, takes the shape of, of what we have from an employment point of view. Thanks so much. Um, from a, a, a regulatory point of view, Brian, is that a, a concern for you, the cyber security threat? Yes, yes is the answer. And I think, you know, it'd be, it'd be completely wrong to say, to say it, it, it wasn't a threat. I, I, I guess, um, uh, I'd say it's still a fairly immature area, and um, uh, I think the personal view, I think the IMO still has some thinking to do around um, uh, helping the sector globally uh, with a framework, but I think we're, we're very, very early days with this, and it's something that um, we as a regulator are going to have to get to grips with, and internationally the IMO are going to have to get to grips with. Thanks so much. So I think that's concluded the questions. What I'd like to start doing now is picking up some of the questions that are coming in. And anybody who wants to pose a question now, if you can start start um, typing them in. But the, the hot topic of debate certainly seems to have been around simulators and particularly the balance between simulators and sea time. I was wondering uh, from the panel, your thoughts. But very, very happy to kick off on this. I, I mean, of course, we've got to get the right balance between sea time and simulators. And we've talked a lot about uh, leadership skills and, you know, one of the fundamental differences between, for example, the airline sector and the maritime sector is uh, a ship's officer is on, on board 24-7 and uh, leading, leading a crew or part of a crew. And so exposure to the sea time is absolutely essential. I think, though, we've also got to be really careful not to put our heads heads in the sand on this. Um, very, very many cadets uh, uh, feedback, and I think it's pretty well um, uh, recognised within the sector that sea time is of highly variable quality. And, um, you know, I was trained as an engineer. Uh, I remember spending hours and hours chipping and filing away at blocks of metal. I do question how much that really taught me. And uh, I know many of our cadets spend hours and hours chipping away at paint on board ships and so on. And I question, uh, given the requirements, just how much that's uh, how much that's doing to them. Simulators provide us with a chance to um, put students through situations that we wouldn't even contemplate uh, putting them through on board ships. And they create an environment where we can be sure they've had a consistent suite of experiences that they've had to manage. And uh, I have to say, I do find the discussions in the sector about use of simulators quite, uh, quite frustrating. This is not one of no sea time or simulator, nor should it be one of all simulator, no sea time. And it can't be that hard, for goodness sake, to find the right balance point between the two. Yeah. And, uh, you know, frankly, if we could get this one resolved quickly now and move on and start using simulators in a rather more intensive way, I think we'd be much better for it. Yes, and just move the echo on from, okay. from what you say there, Brian. It's, 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 it's amazing there can't be a definition given to it in a very simplistic manner uh, on a ratio basis. And maybe that also takes us back to the bigger question of the control of training within the UK and, and, and who's actually in these decision-making uh, criteria Absolutely. points, because I think it's a fundamental overhaul. We need to look to the future. We've got a great opportunity now with our, our changed relationship with the world to look at the UK flag and take the flag yeah. forward. And I think it's a, a, a whole scale review is what's required to try and shape things up for the end user, which is the shipping companies in the future. And I think it's really a, a, a massive area of focus on simulator time as well. I mean, before I came ashore, I was I was a chief engineer with the VLCC. Um, you know, you could be 35 days between ports. I, I can see what happens in ships. We thankfully had a good tra cadet training program on board the ships and, and tried to ensure that they were being trained to become officers for the future. Um, I uh, am very keen on the cosmetic condition of, of all our vessels. Cosmetic condition is, is, is key. But I don't lie awake at night worrying about uh, a rusty U-bolt on deck and, and a cadet spending all his time trying to maintain this thing. 
people looking out the windows, people using all of their skills and their sensory perceptions, using their knowledge they've gained. Um, you gain much more at times in high intensity situations in simulators. Uh, we also look at some of the cadets who spend 180 hours in paper charts during their cadetship and then they get a five day ECTUS course bolted onto the end of it. I think we really have to take a fundamental review of, of what we're looking at to ensure we've got the consistency and using all of the tools that we have available to us to drive the, the seafarers of the future. Yeah, and just, just following on from what Philip said there as well, being involved in the, in the simulator project with the MNTB, you know, we've come across some of these things and, and as Brian's mentioned, the variability is, is one of the main drivers that, that took place for that course was to try and do that sort of redress of balance. If you've got someone on ferries that's doing short sea crossings, they're going to have intense experience on, on the bridge of, of collision regulations whereas if you get someone deep sea just as philip mentioned 35 days between ports you're going to have days with no so that, so there's going to be a difference in that and that's really where it's trying to build that up so that everybody comes out with a similar type of experience be it they've actually had it on ship or they've had it on simulator so it is and i, and I think we we know the cost of simulators but we're not running these things 24 hours a day we're not running them at the weekend so there's plenty of scope for them it's just trying to you know ships run 24 hours a day can we not train people to to react at three o'clock in the morning you know, in a simulator. So we're not we're not using everything to its full potential just yet. And I think there's a little bit more thought has to go into it, as Brian mentioned. Thank you. Yeah, uh, from a college point of view, I suppose the, the one thing I would say is that this is folding in more augmented reality, virtual reality into the simulated working space, and also full mission simulation. So instead of bridge simulators or engine room simulators, you're actually operating a vessel and potentially operating your liaison with the company as well, so that it, it applies to all levels. It's not, we're not just talking about cadets here, we're talking about maintain, maintenance of competence and CPD all the way through. Uh, we do a lot of work with, with shipping companies who are actually wanting to uh, expose in a safe environment uh, multiple times in a week events that they may only encounter once or twice a year uh, in order to allow them to move from ship to ship and route to route. Um, thanks so much. There's, a, there's an interesting uh, uh, debate going on as well about how we involve uh, parents or educate the, the, the public more about the fantastic opportunities that the maritime industry uh, provides. Uh, any thoughts on how we might, might do that? Somebody's talked about TV adverts, but I think there's also a piece about how to engage parents and schools and, and sixth form colleges, etc. Yeah, I, I mean, I haven't been involved in, in, the, in the creation originally of the, the Merchant Navy TV programme in 2010. And that was only shown really in Scotland, but the impact that that had on recruitment at the time was absolutely huge. You know, we've moved on sort of 11 years from there. So whether TV is the right medium because it's so broken now into, into into digital channels but there's definitely something about parents influence you know as, as, as a parent of someone who's just gone into university you know their university choice their course was all discussed around the kitchen table so these things don't go in isolation and, and as, as again some of the chat said social media you know i'm certainly not in the same social media circles as my children i can assure you so there's uh, you know where we would where we would gain influence by going in is not on the parents we've, we've got to focus where the parents are going to be you know and we're, we're probably that facebook generation still so there's a lot there's a lot of thought has to go into that Okay, uh, thanks so much. We're, we're just about out of time now. I'd like to thank you all for your, for your contribution. Um, one point I'd like to leave you, there, there has been debate, and uh, I saw that uh, Paul Little raised the issue of the potential for the UK to have a, a training vessel. Um, this is a model that the, uh, the US have done down. And I guess, uh, uh, just to close, what are the thoughts of, uh, of, of the panel on, on such a, a venture? Not sure. I'm not sure top is, is maybe the answer. You know, there's certainly a place maybe for, for training ships. Uh, I don't think it was a tall ship that was being looked at. I think it was more about uh, an operating yeah, I think, I think that, that provided berths for... Yeah, no, well, I, sorry, I just saw tall ships being, being mentioned quite significantly in the side there. But yeah, a, a training ship, if it's done right with the right right environment and, and the right people and the right ratios on board, will we'll definitely have a benefit. You know whether we can do that on scale would, would have to really be, be be on point um you know and again it's making sure that that sea time experience is both valid relevant and and uh, inspiring uh, and if we can do that then yes absolutely great 
I think there's a place for it like many other things, but I think maybe our priority should be to ensure that all the ships we use as training ships today to bring our cadets through, that there's much more joined up thinking to what happens in the classroom to what happens on board the ships. And we don't let the cadets, the cadets go out to sea in an unstructured manner. And as Brian mentioned earlier on, some of the, the sea training opportunity that they have on board the ship is, is wasted through uh, lack of focus and attention to what they should be prioritizing themselves to become future officers uh, in the Merchant Navy and, and beyond within the UK Maritime um, and, and making sure those opportunities are used rather than a poor regime on board the ships whereby the training is, is, is of a very minor nature. I, and, and I would absolutely echo what Philip said. I'd be in exactly the same place. Uh, let's use what we've got uh, uh, properly uh, uh, and, and let's focus on that. I think a whole lot of this is about getting the right focus. Back. Okay, uh, we'll draw it to a close now. I'd like to say thank you very much to all of you for your contribution. I think it's been a, a really interesting and stimulating debate and uh, obviously a, a lot of interest from the panel. Uh, we appear to have lost Gemma. Hopefully that's just a loss of connection with uh, the vessel she was on mid-channel. And uh, I'll speak to you all soon, I hope. Thank you very thank much. Thank you very much. Thank you.